Derek, I want to welcome you to the Convert with Confidence Summit. And Derek is a certified master hypnosis, hypnotist, and NLP practitioner, and author of two best selling books, Inside the Mind of Sales and Body Language How to Read Anybody. Derek, can you both briefly talk to the audience about what exactly? Does, what, is, what does hypnosis have to do with this sales converting process? Because I know people are already asking, what, what is this? This might seem random, right? But it's, it's really important to know this. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me along. It's great to speak to you and, and lovely to speak to your audience as well. So really excited to share some, some insights today with them. Yes, a very good question. And if we look at, have a look a little bit at my background. My background is in sales. So I've worked for a number of, of big corporate firms a couple of big American firms, actually. And what I realized early on was I've had a fascination from my early 20s with hypnosis and NLP when I first came across it. So I'd been reading about this and researching it through the years. And I realized that sales and hypnosis, NLP, it's nothing more than communication. So to be a good salesperson, it's not about techniques. It's about communication. And the real secrets come from the mid part of the brain, the limbic system, where you really have to tap into. And I guess the, the biggest mistake I see is that people try and logic people into a decision yeah. in sales. Yeah. So you imagine that I came along and I, I saw you in a store and I thought, oh, I quite like the idea of Lydia. I'd quite like to marry Lydia. So what I do is I write out 10 very logical reasons as to why you should marry me. I hope you're not too scared by this prospect. No, it's this great <laughs> analogy. I love it. So I walk over to you and I give you that list. Now, what is your reaction going to be? You're going to like, think, well, who is, who is this? <laughs> what? <laughs> who is this? Exactly. And the reason it hasn't worked is that we've gone straight to the critical mind where you're analyzing them. This is kind of weird behavior. Now, what do we do in business? Well, we do the same thing. Now, if, if you look at how the brain actually works, and this is, this is bringing the hypnosis part into the general communication. Let's give an example. Suppose that you're walking down in the morning and you're in the city center or you're downtown somewhere and you're walking along and the only people you will notice will be people behaving oddly, someone who looks unusual and someone you find very attractive. So we'll leave the attractive person out of it for the time being, okay? So somebody looking a little bit odd. So let's say you're walking down the road. Now the brain acts as a predictive mechanism. It's constantly checking the reality that it predicts to be out there versus what actually happens through the data coming in that's filtered through your senses. So let's say we see a pirate walking towards us and we would be going, suddenly we're out of trance, okay? We're fully alert. Why is somebody dressed as a pirate? Now, the reptilian part of the brain, so the basic part of the brain, it's the part that's, that's designed to protect us. We call this the, the reptilian brain. It's almost like the lizard brain, okay? It has to decide, do we want to fight? Do we want to fornicate? Hopefully not. Or do we want to flee? Do we want to run away? So these are the three things that, that are going on. We then have to contextualize that experience and that happens in the midbrain. So we may have, uh, we'll get emotions. We may laugh and think, this is funny. You may be jealous. You may think, I wish I could be a pirate. <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to be one. You may get angry and think, why is he dressed like a pirate? That's unacceptable. So the emotion comes in and then we have that moment that we've all had where we walk down the street and the little voice inside us goes, now, why would somebody be wearing a pirate's outfit at nine o'clock on a Monday morning in the city center or downtown? Why would somebody do that? So we try and work it out logically. So you can see that in sales, what people tend to do is they go straight and try and logic somebody without actually appealing to the important part of the brain. Because we're creatures of logic justified, or sorry, we're creatures of emotion justified by logic. And we try and logic somebody in the first place. So yeah. what I've done is taken the experience I've had in the sales side and put that together, how the mind works, of which hypnosis plays a big part in how we construct reality. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for those of you watching, can you think of a moment where perhaps you, you were feeling like resistance, like resistance from your prospect, right? And 
it wasn't until I ditched the scripts. Cause I think a large part of this audience, they're like, Oh, it's just a matter of saying the right thing at the right time. <laughs> and while that, that is important and none of it matters, right. Unless they're open, unless they feel safe. Right. And their yeah. guard isn't up. Right. And I think most people's guards are up when they first, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Derek, but are most, most prospects guards already up? when they get onto yeah. like a, a, a call with like a coach or a um, consultant of some kind. Yeah, absolutely. Because we're in that, what you have is you have people who are confused when you first call them. They, we have to contextualize and give closure. We need to know why is somebody calling us? Mm -hmm. So this is the reptile brain. It's trying to protect you. Just because we are not in a physical environment, words can do the same thing to people as well. So we have to try and work out what is it? Why is somebody calling me now what we want to know is why are they calling me what's the purpose and we, we want to know if it is something you're going to talk about make it simple so i can understand and get to the point quickly don't confuse people the confused mind always says no the suspicious mind always says no and the angry mind always says no now guess what you can actually get people angry by confusing them have you ever had a situation yeah. <laughs> where somebody has been talking with somebody you go, I just can't, what are you talking about? I have no yeah. idea. Yeah. I'm completely confused. The other thing is when, when you're talking about this, we have to bear in mind as well how people operate. Now, there's a massive link between the mind and body connection, which is where hypnosis comes in. So yeah. we are virtual at the moment, but let's imagine that I just scooted across. I could beam myself across like the old... Uh, what did you call them? Star Trek uh, uh, movies where I could just come across and I stand next to you. Now, if you were standing up and I started just pressing you slightly on the shoulder, you would start to resist. There would be a pressure back because you don't want to lose your balance. Now, exactly the same thing happens with words. Yeah. So the more we force people, the more they try and resist. And then we have something, I'll keep it polite for this. I call it the FU principle. <laughs> which is who are you telling me what to do yeah and the more you try and pressurize somebody the more they'll resist have you ever been in a bar or, or out for the evening where somebody is quite opinionated and they're desperate to force their opinion on you and it's an issue you're not really that bothered about but because they're forcing you you're going f you and you start defending it and by the end of the evening you're saying why am I actually arguing for this? I'm really not that bothered in the first place. Yeah. So when we're speaking to people, people will often resist what they don't know. So we have to contextualize it. And the big thing is, it's not what you say, it's the way you say it. Mm -hmm. You could be clumsy with words, but if your intention is right and your state is right, then that's the key thing. The key things are state control and rapport. So the four pillars that I build on, I would say there's actually another two we can add, which is belief, state control, rapport, and sharpening your awareness skills, which we read through body language, we read through voice tone. When somebody's on the phone, are they cut? What's the tone like? Are they elaborating on answers? Is it, is it short? Is it maybe a bad time? Now, by being able to say, and being aware of this, say, I sense this may not be the best time. I'll call you tomorrow. That, that then provides context, and it allows the person to get out, and they think, well, this person actually seems quite clued up. They, they understand me. So there's a big, big emphasis on the communication part when you're selling and whatever you're doing. And I, in my opinion, that's where people go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I have this, I have this new principle personally, is that anytime I feel a sense of urgency, I don't do it in everything. Like I used to try to lose weight out of urgency, <laughs> send an email out of urgency, buy out of urgency. And I was like, it never, <laughs> it never <laughs> ever ends up being that what I want back is, is never what I want. So. And so for, you know, this applies to sales calls, right? If you feel a sense of urgency in front of your prospect, what do you think they're going to feel, right? If you're like, exactly. oh, is this going to happen? Am I going to, like, I need this sale or I need the money yeah. or like, what do you think your prospect's going to feel, right? Exactly. And it's so, so important because there is, there is a link actually, there's been some fascinating research done by HeartMath that actually shows people's hearts will start to synchronize and the heart gives out a stronger electromagnetic field than the brain does. And it, it mm -hmm. goes out to, I think about five or six feet. 
uh, I could be corrected on that, but there is an extension that goes out and people start, start to what you call entrain. So that means that the, the electromagnetic waves start to literally sink. And that's why you see people mirroring each other in uh, restaurants through body language. It's this mm -hmm. process of entrainment that's taking place. So it's so important when you go on the phone. I mean, if you go on the phone and you're in a bad mood, I mean, nobody yeah. likes to buy from a grumpy person, but equally, you don't want to come across as a game show host. It's trying to get that, that the balance right. And what I find, a technique that I could use, I can share with people through, through um, state control is I imagine that I'm speaking from my heart. Now, of course I'm not, mm -hmm. right? But what I do is I imagine I'm beaming out a color. Now, you can pick one. It doesn't matter what is gold, purple. It's all metaphorical. And what that does is it tends to put you in a better state. The other thing I would say, a big, big, big mistake in sales I see is through questioning, Lydia. Now, what people do, and I call these people rapid presenters, and they're actually quite funny. Having worked in for some of the big companies and been in thousands of meetings, I've seen this happen over and over again. So people start off and they maybe ask, so how can I help you? And the person then answers the question and they'll say something like, suppose it was, uh, I've, I'm looking for something for back pain. Mm -hmm. And the moment they finished it, out comes the presentation pack. And they start, they start presenting. But we don't know what the actual problem is. Is it a lower back, upper back? Is it yeah. periodic? Is it muscular? Is it disc? We don't know. So we have to start asking more questions. So if you think about this, to think of yourself as being a detective, but kind of a nice detective, okay? And there's a little technique we can use to be nice that comes across very naturally and very easily. We'll come on to that in a second. So we want to ask these questions and we want to ask open questions to open people up. So that's who, when, why, what, how. <laughs> I got them all in there. So get all that to open people up. But also we need to use closed questions because some people tend to talk a lot. So we'd say, look, just so I can clarify, the problem is a disc problem. It's periodic, et cetera, et cetera. You get the picture. OK, now what we can do that makes it very easy to ask questions. So we're not coming across as like the Spanish Inquisition where we're asking question after question. Yeah. Is to use a little technique called question, comment, question. So something like, so tell me what your problem is. And they would say, I've got a sore back. And you might say, you've got a sore back. So you could echo back to them, which creates rapport by using their words, because the most important words that anybody says are the words that just come out of the mouth, okay? I love that. You, everybody, <laughs> rewind this and, and listen to that again. So sorry for interrupting you, Derek. No, so you, you, pleasure. And yes, yeah, so, so you can echo back those, those words to them. And then you make a comment. That must be incredibly frustrating for you. Yeah. And a very, very small note, what a lot of people do and mistake there is they then start talking about themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so they say, that must be incredibly frustrating for you. I remember when I had a bad back and I did this and I went here and I went there and I, and the person's thinking, I don't care. Yeah. It shifts the dynamic, right? It's, it sounds more like a friend of friend versus like, like perhaps like mentor or coach or teacher yeah. dynamic, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And the other big thing as well is, and this is, I'm afraid this is going to be a tough one for people to listen to, but I'm afraid people don't care about you or your product. <laughs> They care about what it can do for them. Yeah. So if I'm going into somebody with back pain, I don't care what the widget is. I don't care what the drug is. I want to know, is it going to work? Is it going to relieve the pain? Can I go back to doing what I was doing before? I've always said to, to people who work as coaches, people don't come to you for entertainment. They go to the theater or a cinema for entertainment. They come to you for a solution to the problem. Yeah. Wow. Like everything for those of you who are struggling with, maybe you're getting a lot of like, okay, I need to think about it or it's too expensive. You know, we often hear these different words from the prospect. And I think one of the most common ones, the common objections, I think a lot of us get is like, oh, it's too expensive. And, and I was recording a video yesterday and what's, what what I was trying to teach people is that it's not even about whether the money it's not as it's not as much about the money being available than it is their desire to spend it 
right? Because I think I think most of us are selling to we're not in third world countries, right? Let's be honest here. If if we if we really valued something, we're gonna go find the money to get it, right? We're gonna get a part time job. We're gonna we're gonna budget. We're gonna put things. We're gonna put some money aside. So when we hear things like you know, I have to talk, I have to think it over, you know, can we, can we follow up? What, in this case, Derek, what has not happened yet? Because I know what people are thinking is, well, the prospect said it was the money. So it must be the money. Now, unless they're going to be out on the street, which is probably 1% of the calls, right? What may be missing here? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good point. People are not actually saying no to you. Mm -hmm. They're actually saying no to themselves. Let me give you an example. Suppose that, again, I go with the back, back, uh, I go with the bad back problem. I haven't got a bad back. I'm just using that as an example. But if I went along to see somebody and I said, how much is it? And they said, it's, say, $300. And I think, that's a bit expensive. Now, there will come a point where I will say, yeah, that's acceptable. If they said it's $5, I go, yeah, absolutely. So they're actually saying no to themselves. Now, one of the things when you're positioning your product or solution is people will tend to, the research backs this up, remember pain more than they will the pleasure, the associated pleasure. Mm -hmm. So if you can relieve a pain rather than make somebody better at something, that is going to be more successful for you. I can still remember as an example, and I can still remember this vividly. I was in a little daydream and I went to the cash point, the hole in the wall. I'm not sure you call it in the States, but where you get the money out, you put your bank card in. And I I took some, I was distracted. My card came back and I didn't take the money. I can still remember that day. I remember what the weather was like and everything. Now I've been to the horse racing a few times and I've won some money. I can't remember what I won there, but I can remember losing money at that cash point machine. Mm. And that, that's quite important uh, to show you a, a, as an example. So one of the things as well, when we are looking at this, we can ask people, we don't want to push them because I've always thought the best way in sales is people resist what they're told and accept what they conclude. So remember, we're talking about the verbal pushing and me pushing you gently on the shoulder. So we need to get them to come to their own conclusion. So the kind of things are, well, what would happen if you didn't do this? Because they're saying no to themselves. It's a priority list. They're saying they would rather have $200 in their bank than have a a better bank. So we can do that. Now, when we do that, we're actually going into the mid part of the brain. We're going into the emotional part. So what would that mean for you? And again, remember, language is a big, big topic. And I'm just writing about that at the moment. It's a big, big topic. You control people's reality by language. So if I said to you, Lydia, whatever you do, don't think about a pink elephant. Please don't think what <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Lots of have, elements. <laughs> yeah, so you have to do it. So yeah. by by mentioning something, you bring that into awareness. So you can get your sales pitch around this by saying to people, "What would happen if you didn't?" Or you know, "Wouldn't it be great if you could go back?" You mentioned you love playing squash and you've got this bad back. What would it mean to you be able to play squash again? I love that. This is you? really. This are you are, for those of you watching, are you are you like paying attention? Are you following through with what Derek is saying? Because oftentimes we might go in and say, Well, hang on a second, I can offer you this, and I've struggled with that, and I can help you with that. And we list all the benefits and what makes us great or, or what makes our <laughs> product great. But what a, a key thing Derek just said is they have to come to that conclusion on their own. And nothing your what you say, nothing you say can matter more, right? Than the insights your prospect is having about their own situation. And I think, I think we often get in our own way, right, Derek? About we think we understand people, you know, we think we get it, we know everything, and you know, actually, the reality is like you'll never understand a hundred percent what people are really feeling and what they need, really, right? Yeah, absolutely. We don't because there's so much data coming in. If you look at the the conscious mind process is about 40 bits of data a second. The unconscious mind process is about 4 million time bits of data a second. I love a great expression I had. Somebody said, I can't remember who it was. I, ne- I never know enough information to be a pessimist. <laughs> there's just so much going on. I love you know? that, yeah. And, and I think this is, this is absolutely key. The other thing is that reality is purely subjective. This is a really difficult one for people to get their head around. They think, I'm actually seeing reality. You're not. 
And the research has, has been uh, done on this. this but you can do it for yourself, actually. A little trick if you want to do when you're doing this at home, get a minute, get a blank piece of paper, put it out in front of you and draw, well, draw a little cross, first of all, about half an inch, quarter to half an inch on a piece of paper, A4 size, on, and, uh, and hold it out in front of you. Now what to do is hold that paper in front of you and just keep looking straight ahead. So don't move your eyes. So you're looking straight ahead as if you're looking through the paper and move the paper to one side. Now, when you move it to one side, at one point, the cross will disappear. Now, what's happened there is you have hit the optic nerve in the eye. Now, in the optic nerve, there is no, or there are no photoreceptors. So what you should see is black, but the brain fills in the gaps. Wow. We could do numerous examples of this. So it's a difficult one to get your head around. The other one you could do, which is a little one, is try this, nod your head up and down and look in the distance. What happens to the image? It's pretty static, isn't it? Now take your mobile phone, hold it in front of you and wiggle it up and down in your wrist. Now look at the image back, see what happens. Everybody's seen the reporters in war zones with the cameras, not so much these days, they've got image stabilized, but the old footage, they're jumping around. So you're not really seeing reality, you're seeing interpretation and everybody has their own map of the world because we can't possibly process all the data and a key thing if, if there's one thing i could get, really get people to think about is everybody has this own map of the world so if lydia and i went to the cinema together she's now terrified i've asked her to marry me and now i'm going to the cinema <laughs> so we go to the cinema and we talk about the the film afterwards or the movie afterwards and lydia says well what did you think about that part of the film i go i don't remember seeing that mm. and then i'll mention something else and she'll say well i didn't pick up on that and she may enjoy the film, Lydia may enjoy the film, I may not like it. It's the same data. We've just processed it differently. When you see a movie for the second time, what happens? You see more in it, don't you? You go, how could I miss that the first time? And this is because it's all relative. So everybody has their own map of the world. So we've got to meet people at their level of reality, not ours. It doesn't matter what we think. Yeah. Nobody in the world thinks they're mad or, or awkward. They <laughs> think everyone else is. I mean, life would just be so much simpler if everyone was a bit more like us, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the key thing is to really make sure that we understand that and try and work out what's going on. So when we're selling to people, we're trying to work out what the map is. And we are really artists. We are world artists. We can move their awareness around. We did it with the pink elephant. I could now say to you, and we'll just do a little thing here. You're now aware of your backside on the seat. You're now aware of the temperature in the room. You're now aware of any noise in the background. You can feel your clothing against your skin. You can't resist it. You have to process it to discount yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. This is such, this is so powerful, everybody. And like, <laughs> if you are really struggling with sales, I know oftentimes we also, we also blame the, the client sometimes, or we end up getting frustrated and it's really of course, they can feel that as well. And we also can end up internalizing that, right? Like if a, if a client gives us an objection, then we end up not feeling like, oh, we're not worth the money or like, who's going to pay me? If, you know, for it, this is, if this is about high ticket sales, which we're focusing on, focusing on high ticket sales, you know, $6,000 and above, especially when we start getting into high ticket, it's one thing to sell, you know, a $1,000 package or a $500 package. But when we start to get into high ticket sales, that's when people's guards really go up, right? That, but that's really where the transformation is. I know for me personally, it was when people had more skin in the game to begin to show up differently. But also when people are paying you that kind of money, it's also, there's a sense of urgency for you to show up differently as well. So there's just more results all around, right? When there's that amount of money in the game. There is, and you, you raise a really important point that goes with that, and that's belief. So that's the other thing, Lydia. And you can't be successful until you become the person that is successful, getting your mindset right. I mean, life is just yeah. a game of zeros. Do you think if we went to Jeff Bezos and asked him for say $100,000, yeah, he would hardly notice it. So it's just to get is where are your zeros and where is your belief system? Now, here's another big secret as well. People want to pay for a solution. And if you, you imagine you're Jeff Bezos and you charged him $300, he would think you can't be very good, can you? Yeah. Because nobody. So there is an element of this. There was, there was an advert in, in Europe we had for a beer. It's called Stella Artois. And they used to put on the, 
TV and at the movie theater and it said reassuringly expensive. I love that. <laughs> Yeah. And if you yeah. think about it, you know, if you say, if somebody says to you, well, you're very expensive, that what happens is people tend to get deflated and they think, well, yeah. well, 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 okay, I can maybe do you a deal. You should actually say, well, yes, of course, but, but I am the best or I am a leader in my field. Yeah. The other little tip I can give you as well is when it comes to pricing is there's a, a little technique you can use called price anchoring. And the research backs this up as well. Now, remember when we're selling we're getting away from this part, the logical mind. We want, don't want to do that. Everybody's smart. We can critique things. We want the emotional part of the brain, okay? So this is all about how you feel, not how you think and analyze. I want you just to notice how you feel in the two different scenarios here, okay? If I said to you and you said, well, how much does this cost, Derek? Okay. And I could say, I get paid up to anything up to $12,000 for doing this work. But for you, it's $6,000. Okay. Now notice the difference in that versus if I said, and they said, how much is it going to cost? And I said, it's $6,000. I should have done it the other way around for the context, but do you see the point? Yeah. We'll do it again. So if I said it costs $6,000, and then I say, I get paid anything up to, now you don't want to lie, but you could theoretically pick your best rate with your best client, assuming you're fully booked from I don't know, five in the morning to, and you could actually do that. And, and then you get a different emotion because what you've done is the brain works on contrast. Remember, it can't ignore the pink elephant. So it's got the $12,000 in the mind. So anything for 12, less than 12,000 is a bargain. You've saved 6,000 as opposed to paying for six. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's subtle. Of course, these things are not going to work every time. And the other thing I want to share with people as well is don't expect that every single client you're going to, you're going to close. Some people you just won't. That's life. It's numbers. But the aim is to get your numbers higher of conversions. There's another thing I can share with, with some of your viewers as well. And that is, let's be positive about rejections. Right. Yeah. Once, you, once you know your numbers, if you know your numbers are for every 10 contacts, whatever they are, that you will get, say, four inquiries of which you get one sale, but within those four inquiries, you may get a rude person. So we'll say of the 10, you'll get one rude person in those 10 calls. Let's suppose that you ring up and you get that rude person. Okay. We all come off that and they go, why don't they like me? And, and you get annoyed. You should actually go, that's fantastic. Yeah. Because now they're out the way. The next nine calls are going to be great. I can't think of how many times. I, yeah. You've, you, you go, I've just, had, I've just had four rejections. That's fantastic. Because I know in my ratio that they're out the way. Now I'm going to close somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all about reframing. Is that glass half empty or is it half full? Well, neither of those, those, and those statements are actually true. The true one is it's, it contains 50% liquid. Yeah. And I That's know often, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt you, no, Eric. Um, just when you were, when you were talking, something important also um, came up because what we're talking about here is a lot of the unconscious stuff that's going on during yeah. the prospecting. Like, I think we're so focused on the conscious, the critical thinking. And so we we're focused on the conscious critical thinking of our prospect. But, you know, one thing I've also noticed in these, con these consultations is that people are unconsciously testing us to see if we're congruent, right? Oh, Cause yeah. I know, um, I know in the past, there's been times I've been like, uh, I want to say this price, but no, it's, it's my old price. Or I've had, I've worked with clients who are like, Oh, I can't get out my new rates because of whatever fear of uh, the uh, dealing with objections, yeah. rejections, or, you know, abandonment can also get in the way of our sales calls. But oftentimes, or I'd say all the time, people are testing us to see if we're, we're like, are, are they for real? Right. Yeah. When we're on these calls. And it's very subtle. It's very unconscious. Most people aren't going to know this, right? Unless they're a hypnotist right? <laughs> or a doctor <laughs> of some sort. Right. But I can think of some specific times when I could, I did, it didn't occur to me till after that the, the prospect was like, is she could grow it kind of poke in? Like, is she, is she for real? Does she really think like she's worth that? Now they may not be the best client because you don't want a client that's going to sit there and poke at you but it was interesting I was like oh that's interesting that people in 
they will consciously test you, but they will, a lot of people don't even know they're doing this to see if you are qualified, if they feel safe with you, if they feel like they can be themselves, they can reveal these deepest yeah. things, Greg, because they're, they're sharing things they probably haven't shared with their spouse on these calls. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, th I think as well, it's that you raise a very important point there about being uh, congruent uh, is to make sure you display that. So if you're involved in any form, we don't have to be a hy hypnotist to know that the work begins way, way, any stage hypnotist knows the work begins way, way before the actual stage hypnosis. It begins with the posters through suggestion. Now there is something called priming that you can prime people. So if you are, say, a hypnotherapist and you wear a white coat, you will have more success than if you don't, because people associate it. Now, I see you've got certificates in the background on, the, on your wall there. That is actually a very powerful thing to do. And the research has shown that people will be more compliant when they see an authority figure or an establishment of authority. Mm -hmm. So by having things like that, if you're a coach or something, have endorsements there, have news clippings if you've been in the papers. If you've had anything online, you print it out, have it there so that you're creating this impression. You're creating this impression of value the whole time. Yeah. And another thing, just to sh if I can just share with people as well, it's really important. And I, I would urge people to write this down and really remember it, okay? People in power ask questions. Yeah. Those not in power answer them, okay? Now, that may seem a little bit glib. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about bosses, who ask questions? Bosses, policemen, lawyers, they all ask questions. Now, one of the ways that people get themselves in trouble, and even when this comes to pitching, is they answer the question without knowing what the question really is. Let me give you an example. Suppose Lydia and I are in an office, and I said to her, Lydia, I'm really unhappy with your work. It's just chaotic. Now, what does that actually mean? It doesn't mean anything. Cha yeah. What does chaotic mean? I don't know. I'm drawing blanks. <laughs> Cha chaotic's an adjective. It, it has your own, somebody, chaos to some person is organization to another in varying degrees. So it doesn't actually mean anything. So we have to go back. And this is the great, if somebody says, well, you're too expensive. Some people say, oh, well, I can give you a 50 minute discount. Now, one of the things to do is you have to hold your position. So you want to find out what does expensive look like to them? They may only want a 5% discount. They may not really want any discount. They just, they want, may be testing you. So you have to go back and hold your position. And that's where negotiation comes in. Okay, now a little technique you can use, and I, I picked this up way, way years ago. It's a little bit direct salesy, okay? But, you know, you can still do it. Good negotiation will do that. It's the win, so you go... So if somebody says that to you, you know, you need to cut this by immediately, people will pick up on that and they say, oh, well, well perhaps this discount would do. So beware of somebody if they do the wince on you, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a classic negotiation tick, trick. Good negotiators will know about this, okay? But the main thing is belief. You have to believe in yourself. You are providing, you are a professional. You are providing a solution to somebody's problem. You are helping them get from where they are at the moment because they're stuck because most people don't know what they want and what the problem is right yeah if you did and they could read it on a blog they wouldn't be speaking to you so you're there to help them and you can do that so you have to hold your position and create the value and the authority now just another thing if, we, if we're talking about being online as well Lydia be very careful of your backdrop now I've gone for the natural one behind us today but if you're wanting to create authority I have been on calls before where the door has been opened in the bathroom and the toilet has been on display. I mean, it's hardly yeah. creating the right, right impression. So be yeah. very, very careful. Be careful what you're wearing as well. The, this is all nonverbal communication. And I've written at length about this, the effect it has, it's all priming. Just as Lydia's certificates there will establish credibility. If you turn up and you're speaking to a client wearing, I'll use an extreme example, an Iron Maiden t-shirt, <laughs> is that really the image that you want to convey now yeah. some people can get away with it they can, of course they can but it's always better to know the rules first before you break them yeah this you know what if you are struggling in sales if, if if the word or the if you're just thinking about getting on a sales call is paralyzing to you this is really where you kind of have to back up 
and see it's like even before you get on the sales call what's going on with you like just like you said Derek like what's your background and even I hear a lot of people say well hey now we're on zoom for the most part so nobody can see from like here down right (laughs) and I'm like when I only show up like dressed halfway I don't show up all the way mentally and so like careful with like you know um what is it sort of sort of half haphazardly showing up and also you know we can talk about like your tone of voice and of course your eye contact and this this web just keeps going but all of this is so important your presentation uh, along with course how you're speaking but this this process of priming what your background looks like how you're dressed if you don't feel empowered or if you don't feel like you're like that let's say five thousand dollar coach I would start to explore like what, in fact, this was a powerful question that I asked my clients is, so what's the gap between you and a $5,000 coach? What's missing so that you feel like you you've earned that you're the $10,000 coach or the $20,000 coach. And instantly you're going to start to have insights. I hear things like, Oh, you know, I, I need to be working out more. I need to be more fit. I need to have better eye contact. I don't dress, you know, like a 5,000, $10,000 coach. It's just all these little subtle unconscious messages we're giving off. Yeah, right. <laughs> absolutely. And getting back to state control, there's some really easy ways you can do this because you talk about, you're absolutely right, Lydia. You know, it's important. That it's not just one thing in isolation. I talk about the principle of stacking. It's everything. You're trying to create this image and this persona where every other part reinforces the previous part. Think of it as a bicycle wheel with lots of spokes. So imagine you've got most of the spokes there, but one or two are missing. If you go over a bump in the road or the highway, then the bicycle wheel is going to buckle. So you've got a weak point. So you need to make sure the whole proposition is strong. Now on state control, one of the things you can do is there is a strong link between this mind-body connection. If you don't believe me, next time you're feeling depressed, just look up in the air and see, look up in the air and see if you can do depression. Okay. Oh, wow. It's very difficult because every body position is associated with an emotion. How many runners have you seen when they've won a race, they suddenly go like this? You know, it's a common, so, so there is this link. So you can trick your physiology by getting into a, a good body position beforehand. And the research backs this up by standing almost, look at policemen when they, cut, they confront people, they've got their feet wide apart, they make themselves yeah. bigger, the hands and the straight head. on. Right, straight, yeah, on. straight on so this is all pre- and your physio do that for a few minutes and your physiology will change and the other thing as well is when you're on these calls have an air of expectation when i was in sales i kind of really didn't worry where the deal was going to happen i just assumed it did and then you have it's almost like i call i, I like to think of it as the columbo type pose you know where you are when somebody doesn't want to do it, you're almost puzzled that's, that's really strange how bizarre <laughs> you know, and, and so you have this air of ex- expectancy that it's perfectly normal for people to work with you, not the other way around, and never, ever appear poly- apologetic. And I would encourage people just on the voice as well, just briefly on that, there's some important things you can do. And just be aware of this. My knowledge of, of the US is not as extensive, obviously, because I'm not from there. But there are certain accents I've heard where people go up at the end of the sentence. And mm-hmm. when you go up at the end of the sentence it creates a question (laughs) rather than you need to go down. If you think, if I said to you, Lydia, uh, sorry, Lydia, get down. The voice goes down. So it's a command. So it's authority. (laughs) Yeah. So we need to make sure that we control that when we're doing this and the other one to watch as well, a big one, a big one I've seen in restaurants where people will ask a question and then they use meta language. So they'll say something like in the UK, they'll say something like, uh, would you like some water for the table at all? At all. That indicates nervousness. So make your questions direct and stop. No matter language, just stop and then wait for the other person. Yeah. Are we I happy think- to not? Are we happy to proceed if this is okay? If it's not too much trouble? If you don't mind, perhaps if it is, then we could always rearrange. I could reduce my fees if you're not. Are you happy to proceed? Bye. I love it. Yeah. This, I, I remember, and it said anxiety that may start to consume us when, because I know what, 
it may feel painful. I think a lot of this audience struggles with feeling guilty around charging people, like sort of, it's like they observe it as like a, a win take situation versus a win win. So you're, yeah. you're winning and, and then you're taking from them. But it's like, if you haven't uncovered what is in it for your client or your prospect, okay that's where that's the gap that needs to be filled. What's in it for them? What are, what are 50 right. reasons why <laughs> yeah, yeah. it should be you versus the next fitness coach or relationship coach or business coach? Because I guarantee you, you have your own angle. You have your own story, which is why you're doing what you're doing, right? So if you're, if you're not able to come up with be congruent and also, you know, know all of these little messages are being sent off and back, let's back up here. And I love what you talked about with the inflection points. And then we often want to say our rate and we want to ease their pain, yeah. right? Well, well, we can do installments. We can, well, you know, because you're, you're, I, you're a current client, I'll drop my price and we try to ease their pain. Yeah. But what I've learned, Derek, and I want to hear your feedback as, as we wrap up here, I, need, I know we need to wrap up, but it's like that moment of discomfort is everything. That is yeah. the choice. That is the moment where they're like, they need to be stretched or else if, as long as they're comfortable with, oh yeah, $600 easy, there's not going to be any change in the behavior, right? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you're right when it comes to negotiating and, and making these statements, you have to have an air of authority. So mm -hmm. you make your statement and then just be quiet. The biggest trick in negotiation, if ever you're negotiating is you keep quiet. The person who speaks first loses. I've had instances where it literally has been minutes. Now, yeah. when you're doing this, it's a bit like if you're working on public speaking and I say, insert a pause. People will do it, record themselves, and they won't even notice it. You've really got to exaggerate it. It feels uncomfortable. Yeah. It will feel uncomfortable with this as well. You just have to sit there and you just wait. Now, <laughs> if you're actually, pers it's, I'll give you another tip as well. If you're doing this face-to-face -face and you see somebody stroking their chin and looking up, you definitely do not interrupt because they're in evaluation mode. You just keep quiet. Yeah. So the chin stroking gestures for men are slightly different. It's a generalization, but like this, women tend to stroke more like that away. So it's the thing that's the generalization. Okay. But look for those. And if you see those, you really need to be quiet. Yeah. Yep. Because people are, uh, people will give away discounts and they really start unselling. I've actually been, <laughs> I was actually in a pitch once where, we closed the deal and the person I was with then started talking and they were doing their best to unsell what we'd sold. Oh, wow. So once you've yeah. got it, just be quiet. The other thing I would just give a little bit of advice to as well is be very, very careful if you're online or if you're doing it face to face and you've managed to get a nice big client and you've got a great fee don't start celebrating immediately. <laughs> you know, Zoom may not have gone off and you know, they may hear you shouting with delight as they leave the office. So just make sure they're in the car or they're well outside, then do your celebrations. I've known businesses yeah. actually will watch people and they'll watch them out the window if they've conducted a big, big deal to find out what the reaction is. Wow. Yeah. And if there are other people in the building as well, you know, just be careful, be very, very careful. So I'm always very, very careful with that. Make sure that your Zoom is off, even go out the room and do your celebrations because you never know. We've all had these instances where microphones have been left on. <laughs> yeah, I can think of, um, you know, I never sort of celebrate until I have the agreement signed. I right. feel like that until the money's in my bank account, yeah. then it doesn't matter because again, we have that expectation. And then also we start to sabotage, we start to get excited. And I can guarantee you, even if your prospect is not in the same building as you, they, it's going to start to, you know, I mean, this is a little bit woo woo, but this vibration starts to go out. It'll start to affect your messages, your emails. And I can think of so many yeah. moments where I got too excited and they feel the excitement. And it's like, it just depends on like the, what you're excited about that. That's the message they're going to receive. Right. But now what I do is like, if, you know, let's say like I talked to a prospect yesterday, she decided to go with the pay in full. Right. So that's, that's a huge sum, but 
I did. I'm like, I'm not getting excited because I need to know she's in it. Like she's committed. That transaction has actually completed because yeah. otherwise what's the point of celebrating if, if you don't have the evidence that they are in it? Cause words, totally. word exchange is great, but do you have yeah. the evidence that they're like, I'm ready to go. And that, that's, that's a great point that because I, I was on a Facebook group the other day and people were talking about how many followers they've got. And I said, that's great. Follow us for show, you know, yeah. but sales for dough. You know, that's yeah. that basically it. So, you know, you're absolutely right. When the money's in the bank, that's it. It's you know, game time. And, that, and that's great. The other thing I do as well is I tend to charge people up front, you know, and try and put them in blocks. Now, there's a way you can do this. And what you do is you use a little phrase called, it's normal behavior or most of my clients. Now, you fra you've pre-framed again, haven't you? So what you've done by saying this, most of my yeah. clients, or it's normal practice, that means if they don't do it, it's not normal. And people don't like to be abnormal. They like to go with the herd. Yeah. So it's subtle. It's not going to work every time. But these, remember, we're talking about layering here. I haven't talked about that principle, but it's, it's in too much detail. But you're trying to get as many things reinforcing. We touched on it a bit with the mm -hmm. bicycle wheel. So we're trying to do that and, and make sure that we, and I always do that because it saves you having to chase them up because people always can't find their card or they're going to do it. They can't find their webs. Easier. It's easy. I just say it's easier for everyone. And this is the way I operate. Yeah. Yep. Just easy. Make it easy. Make it as yeah. easy as you can for yourself, but also for them Absolutely. as well. And Absolutely. I love, you know, as, um, and I love Derek, how you talk about like, don't talk them out of the sale. And, and I know what, <laughs> I'm, do what I've observed is I oh. honestly, what I honestly believe is the minute you're in front of each other, the transaction's done. Yeah, like yeah. they're on the phone because they're sold. Yeah, but yeah. the worst thing we do is we go in and we're <laughs> like, yeah, I know it's expensive. I know, I know, <laughs> I know time is tight. I, you agree with them on all their objections. And of course yeah. they're going to be like, yeah, you're right. Now is not the time. And it's like, like, so what if you thought about it? Like it's done the moment you get on the phone and all you're doing is educating them. You're just educating them on, yeah, here's, here's all the reasons why you're here. Right. And here's all the reasons why this, this service is a good fit for you. Just educating versus the convincing or begging that might unconsciously go on or hoping and wishing. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah and there's, a, there's another little thing that you can do as well as the ideas come to me that, that I use and people are welcome to use this as well. It's be very, very careful with the power of words. Okay. Think about the words and think about outcome, freedom fighter and terrorist. The outcome is often similar, but the perception is different, isn't it, between the two words? So we, if you talk about fees and cost, but, and I want you now to notice how different you feel. This is all about feeling, okay? So we're not trying to logic this. Notice the word investment. Investment applies, is good, grows, it's good for you. So you talk about, I talk about your investment. Now, depending on what you're doing, what type of coach or consultant you are, you can use that. But it sounds much better, doesn't it? Again, these things are subtle. Yeah. But I use that and I find that works because people like the word investment, don't they? Yeah, I love it. feels good. It's investment. People don't like, it, people don't like invoices and fees. And, you know. <laughs> it's like, ouch, 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 ouch. I feel things like coming at pain, you. It's pain. You know, investment's great. <laughs> we don't want pain. We want pleasure. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, as, as we honor everyone's time here, uh, Derek, I, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here it's, and you should thank yourselves for showing up for this interview because go back and watch this again. Like Derek has given you so many tiny things. You can start to change right now. Like this isn't something that takes months, doesn't take years. These are things, these are subtle state changes and, you know, change your background, little things you can do right now. So Derek, and I know you have a little more for this audience. You have a couple free gifts. You have a 15 minute supercharger audio and a, an ex, a sales accelerator cheat sheet. If you could tell us briefly about that and we'll, yes. we'll point everyone to the links underneath. Yeah, the sales accelerator is, is going to be a condensed version of a lot of things that you can use easily and quickly and effectively with your clients. And then the 50 minute supercharger is part of, I've got a number of these audio programs, but I'd like to give this one away. What this is useful for is you, you actually do nothing with this. It's great. You just sit down when you've got a quiet moment, you pop it on your, your headphones on or your earplugs or earphones, whatever they are, sit down. Just relax for 15 minutes and this audio will speak to your unconscious mind. So when you're feeling a bit tired, a bit run down, you're a bit fed up, put it back on. And by the time you've finished, you will be a new person. You'll have bags of energy. 
So I use these when, I, when I'm working with people to talk to, remember we've talked about the two parts of the mind, the unconscious, that part, and we also the conscious. So this speaks to your unconscious. So you don't have to do anything. It's a great way to learn. And you just keep playing it regularly, wherever you need it, and it will work wonders for you. Awesome. And then I know you have a sales accelerator cheat sheet as well. A sales, I should have explained, yeah, the sales accelerator cheat sheet is, that's a condensed version of a lot of the things we've talked about today. And that's got all lots of hints on it and things that you can do and things that will work for you. So it's if you like a condensed version of things that I write about. Yeah. Yeah. So you quick can use that immediately. Yeah. Quick go to if, if you're struggling and you're maybe you, your anxiety is all about the sales, um, the sales process, like go click the link below, go grab these two free gifts. These links are only going to be available for 48 hours. So if this conversation resonated with you and you don't even know maybe what the reptilian mind is or what unconscious even means, go check out more of Derek's books. He's got two books on Amazon um, and I'm sure other places they can go find that, but there's the um, how to read any body, which is really important when it comes to prospecting and also um, inside the mind of sales, which is obviously what we all <laughs> want to know. So Derek, I want to thank you so much for being I with us today for your time. You're Pleasure. obviously like a gold mine of information <laughs> when it comes to the unconscious mind and, and sales. So thank you for being here. Derek. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Lovely to speak to your audience. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.